Gone at last, gone at last. My sins, they're gone at last. I've had a long streak of that bad, bad time. My sins, they are gone at last. Let's go. Gone at last. took me in then a light from heaven filled my soul bade my heart in love wrote my name above just to talk with Jesus made me whole they're gone at last gone at last my sins are gone I've had a long streak of that bad, bad time. My sins, they are gone at last. Let's play.
make this worship song our prayer today. Lord, prepare be a sanctuary pure and holy try pray that you'll move among your people today. We pray, God, that you'll prepare every mind, every heart, and every spirit to be a sanctuary. That each one, Lord, will look to you. I pray, God, that you'll minister to every person in this place today. Touch every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl at the point of their need. And we'll praise you for time and eternity. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Stephan, if you want to go back, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss the children. Children, 
those of you that want to go to Children's Church, if you'll follow Miss Stephanie, she'll take you out the back and down to the children's ministry. We're thankful for each one. Ushers, I want you to come. Let's receive the morning tithe and offering. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Say amen. amen. Just turn to your neighbor and say, I love you so much I can't hardly stand it. <laughs> Now, I have to ask, and I want you to be honest with me, who, who ate too much on Thanksgiving? Just go ahead and confess your sin one to another. I, I did. The Bible does say something of gluttony. And so, I, I prob- had it not been for that nearly whole pumpkin pie I ate, perhaps I could have avoided repenting this morning. <laughs> But did you, ha- did you have a good time with your family on Thanksgiving this past week? Good. I'm glad you had a good time. We're thankful for each one that's here, each one that's online. We appreciate so much uh, each of you and your faithfulness to God, your faithfulness to give to the cause of Christ. And we're going to come to you for your tithe and offering. And we, we appreciate so much your willingness to, to support that which God is doing. God's doing great things in our church in just the last couple of years, uh, you know, we, since we've started, we've seen tremendous great things happen. We're excited about everything. We're continuing to grow. Uh, new people are coming. New people are coming to faith in Christ. And that includes those of you online. And I ask you to grow this online. Share this with somebody. You never know who it's going to touch, what life will be changed, if they listen to just a little bit of it or the whole service. All it takes is a little bit for God to touch someone's heart. So please share this with someone today. Uh, Share it on your Facebook page or wherever, whatever social media outlet. Please share it and allow God to use this in someone's life today. Father, I pray that you'll bless this offering. Multiply it to your glory and for your use. In Jesus' name, amen. Standing in the wrong place. You can stand wherever you want. (laughs) Smoke clouds all around. Couldn't see your face. Darkness consumes. 
Is this thing working? This mic? Yeah, good. <clears throat> I want you to turn in your Bible with me this morning to Psalm 121. <clears throat> Psalm 121. We're going to read the entirety of the chapter. Psalm 121. Of course, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to have you stand, please, in reverence of God's Word. Psalm 121, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help come from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth, and even forevermore. And I want to direct your attention to verse 2. For David said, my help comes from the Lord. My help comes from the Lord. <clears throat> and I want to deal with this statement that we've heard so many times and perhaps have said it so many times. How many have ever heard someone say this? Now remember, the Lord helps those who help themselves. How many have ever heard that? How many have ever said that? The Lord helps those who help themselves. We're going to deal with that today. And there are three things that I'm going to have you consider. First of all, I'm going to have you consider the half-truth. <clears throat> and then I'm going to have you consider the untruth of that statement. And then the real truth. The half-truth, the untruth, and the real truth. Father, I pray that you'll add your blessing to the reading and to the preaching of your word. I ask, Lord, that through the anointing of the Holy Ghost, you would come and make divine truth effective in our hearts and in our lives. May each of us look to the hills from whence comes our help. May each of us know that our help comes from the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Three things about this popular statement that we have said and heard probably most of our lives. The Lord helps those who help themselves. I want you to consider today the half-truth, the untruth, and the real truth. First of all, the half-truth. The half-truth of this statement is this. God is limited... By our apathy. So the half-truth of God helps those who help themselves is that God is limited by our apathy. Reminds me of the fellow that said to another man, what is apathy? The response, I don't know and I don't care. That, of course, is what apathy is. I don't care. And we sit back in a seat of do nothing and expect great reward. Oh, I'm believing God's going to give me a great job, but haven't filled out one application. <laughs> haven't done one search on uh, LinkedIn or anywhere else. I believe, I remember growing up, there was a, a fellow at our church and he was out of work and Every single time, now back in the tradition I grew up in, they would gather around the altar for prayer at mid-service. And the men would come up on the platform and in the choir loft and the ladies would stay down around the altar and they would take prayer requests from the people. And even have a request and someone would say, will you pray for this or pray for that? And for weeks this man would say, will you please pray that I find a job? Finally, the pastor went to him one day and said, 
Have you looked for a job? No, I've just been sitting at home praying that God would send me a job. And so my pastor said, maybe it would be a good idea if you prayed and then also put feet to your prayers. And he said, if you work like it depends on you and pray like it depends on God, something big might really happen. Somebody say amen. The half truth is, apathy is never rewarded by God. Slothfulness is certainly a sin in his eyes. I remind you, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. In other words, he was saying, I demand a response. I demand action on your part. If you want to be saved, follow me. Take up your cross. Lay down your life. Take responsibility. Do something about it. And it was the brother of, James, the brother of Jesus, James, that said, Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Now that doesn't mean works saves me. But what it does mean is when I put faith in Christ, as a result of that, there'll be some action on my part. And whenever I respond to God's word and do what I'm supposed to do, something supernatural happens in God's efficiency and economy. There's something powerful that takes place. Oh yeah, the half truth of this statement is simply this. Apathy is never rewarded by God and it limits God when we do nothing on our part. Important for you to understand this today. That faith without works is certainly dead. But let's not be erroneous and put all of it on man. I remember years ago, Bill O'Reilly was interviewing a pastor in New York, and this pastor had a fantastic ministry of working with the homeless. Mr. O'Reilly got a little bit uh, perturbed by what some of the things he was saying, and he said, I think Jesus would demand something of them, and he said, remember that passage. Now, Mr. O'Reilly said, remember that passage in the Bible, God helps those who help themselves. To which the pastor looked and said, Mr. O'Reilly, obviously you don't know your Bible, because that is not in the Bible. The half-truth, God is limited by your, by my apathy. Uh, let me give you the untruth. The untruth is self-help is the best help. Self-help is the best help. 1967. An American psychiatrist by the name of Thomas Harris wrote a book. How many remember what that book is? He wrote a book, I'm okay, you're okay. And this began a wave of interest in America for self-help. The problem is, self-help is not the essence of the gospel. But it is something that we pay a large amount of attention and money toward these days. If you go to a bookstore, the largest section in the bookstore, what is it? Self-help. I mean, everybody and their brother has a book out now, How to Help Yourself how to do something, how to improve. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that helping yourself and doing things to better yourself is a negative thing. I think it's a positive thing. I think we ought to do the best we can with what we have been given. Amen? I want to look the best I can, don't you? Hmm? 
That's why this morning, most of you, I hope, got in the shower and helped yourself to the shampoo (laughs) and the dial soap or whatever it is you use. I hope you did. I hope you availed yourself and helped yourself to deodorant. You fixed your hair and teased it up and made it look as good as it could possibly look. You got dressed and you look as good as you possibly can. You look real good this morning. You've helped yourself real well. Now, if you chose to not help yourself, I'd just soon not shake your hand after church. (laughs) Now, there's nothing wrong with self-help. There's nothing wrong with saying, how do I better my finances? How do I better my my intellectual levels? How do I improve my skill in whatever trade or occupation I may be in? There's nothing wrong. It's in fact, it's, it's, it's important. It is expected. We should do that. Growth is expected. We ought to do things to help ourselves. But oh, we have made self-help a God in America. And we have graduated to the point that even the pulpits in America, we are full of self-help. What am I going to do to improve? Make things better. But, man, the untruth is, is that self-help is the best help. Because if we're honest with ourselves, all of us will come to a place in life. I don't care who you are, and I don't care how good you have it, and it doesn't matter how educated you are, how refined you are, how much money you have, I promise you, you will bump up against things in life that's out of your control. And all of your effort cannot solve it. Reminds me of the fellow that was visiting the Grand Canyon and he thought, I'm going to get off course. I'm going to do some self-exploration. And he got off the path and got where there wasn't anybody else around, where the path had not been beaten. And he got over to this high area and the ground started shifting and the Rocks underneath his feet, and he slipped. Knew that he was going to fall to his demise, and as he slipped, there was a there was a tree growing out of the rocks. And he grabbed hold of that tree, and there he is dangling. And he starts to cry for help. Help! Is there anybody up there? Help! He had got away from everybody else. He was alone, but he's crying, help! And he heard a voice. I'm here. Who are you? Help! I'm God. And God spoke to the man hanging, hanging, dangling over his doom. And he said, just let go and I'll catch you. Is there anybody else up there? (laughs) Anyone else? Help! Isn't that what we do? We think in our human ingenuity, we can't fix it, so let's find another human. Let's go to somebody else. And there's things in the deep core of our being and there are parts of who we are that there's no counselor, no psychiatrist, no psychologist, no preacher, no church, no religion, No person, no mother, no father, no son, daughter, friend, or anybody else that's going to help us and fix it. Oh, my marriage is falling apart. So we go get counsel for someone that just got divorced. Does that make sense to you? I can't seem to stop drinking. Well, we go get counsel from somebody at the bar. I'm really preaching better than you're letting on right now. I promise you I am. Let's go talk to some other. Is there anybody else? 
See, the untruth of God helps those who help themselves is this. Self-help or human help is the best help. But let me give you the real truth, and this is what I'm going to preach. All of that was the introduction. (laughs) God helps those who help themselves. The real truth is this. Listen to me. God helps those who cannot help themselves. The greatest revelation you're going to come to is realizing you are insolvent. The greatest revelation you and I can realize is understanding we, our own insolvency. Jesus taught us this in the Beatitudes and he said it right off the chute. Immediately he said this, happy or blessed are those who are poor in spirit. In other words, he was saying those people who realize they are spiritually insolvent, that they cannot save themselves. They cannot reach down, grab a hold of their own bootstraps and lift themselves out out of the gutter. You and I are helpless against sin, against self, against selfishness. We are born into sin. We are shapened in iniquity. Isn't it interesting that we have the ability to conquer so many things? Medically, we have made advances that far exceed our imagination. We can crack open someone's chest, take their heart out, work on it, put it back in, sew them back up, and they live another 10 years. That's fascinating to me. Man has the ability in this scientific world to, with the power of boosters, push a piece of hunk of iron off of the earth with such force that the gravity of the moon pulls it in. It gets off and takes a stroll and pushes it back off the moon and comes back down to earth and can't conquer his own habits. We're more educated than we've ever been. We are insolvent. We have greater solutions than we ever had and bigger problems than we've ever had. All based in humanity. You know why? Because sin is man's biggest issue. And we don't have the ability through medical science or psychology who probes into the inner world of a man's mind and tries to unravel his conflicts. And all the advances we've made in psychology and now we've raised a generation that don't know whether to go to the potty or go pee in sand in the bathroom. That's crude, but it's the truth. Making an appeal, please put a sandbox, a litter box in the bathroom because my kid identifies as a furry. You understand that's a real thing going on out there. That people are asking for that. But yet we've made such, we've waged such battles psychologically. Really? I'm not a he or a she, I'm just a they or a them. Man, I tell you, I I just wish for someone knew how to say amen in this church this morning. I'm not trying to be mean, that's reality. That's what we're dealing with. It's absurd. Now, I don't hate no one. I love everybody. But we think helping is adopting ludicrous things that go completely even against nature. That's that's what's going to help. No, that's not going to help. Y'all still tired from the turkey, aren't you? David painted a perfect picture of humanity when he said, I waited patiently for God. I was in a horrible pit in the miry clay. I scratched, I dug, I tried to get out, I could not get out. 
He said, finally, I cried unto God and God heard my cry and he didn't leave me in my plight, but he came, he inclined unto me, he came to where I was and he lifted me out and set my feet on a solid rock and established my goings. David said, I could not save myself. I could not get out of the pit, but in this quagmire of sin and degradation, God came down. Isn't that what we're getting ready to celebrate? The fact that Jesus Christ left heaven 2,000 years years ago and came to this earth uh, nestled in a barn uh, this little babe uh, who grew and died on a cross uh, and gave his life uh, so that you and I could find forgiveness uh, and salvation our forgiveness of sin uh, our help uh, look under the hills uh, look to the Lord uh, look to God he's the only one uh, that can save us Uh, he's the only one that can save our nation he's the only one that can save our world Uh, we must look uh, to him for our help we must look to him for our help we can't save ourselves we can't get where he wants us to get ourselves how does he help he comes he comes down he lifts david out of the pit Another place he says to David, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Have you ever considered how God orders our steps? We think how God orders our steps is, he says, all right, now I want you to go here, here, and here. We think he does them in threes just like Dora the Explorer did. (laughs) Hadn't thought about Dora forever. My little girl always watched Dora the Explorer. I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. (laughs) You go to the river and then you go to grandma's house and then back, it was three steps. We, We get this idea, that's how he orders our steps. And he tells us where to go. You do understand that's not the biblical picture. We can't go. He can tell me, Troy, I want you to go over here and I want you to do this. And I am absolutely powerless to accomplish it. Here we are. We're bumping up against winter. I hate winter, don't you? I just hate it. I I don't know why I still live in this part of the country. I should be in Florida. I've been considering, I've been considering having two churches, one for One part of the year here and in another cross point in Florida during the winter. (laughs) I'm just, I'm only teasing. I wish I could do that, but I'm just teasing. I like it warm. But I remember when I was young, we used to have some real winters. Winter was rough. Not like it is now. I guess it's global warming. How many remember, some of you will remember that old enough to, to know about the, the blizzard in 78, 79, we had two back to back years, 78, 79, man, the river was froze over, people driving across the river. Well, we lived over in the hills. I grew up nestled there in Appalachia, in the foothills, hillbilly folks. That's why I read that scripture this morning. I'll look under the hills. We grew up in the hills, and we had some gray sleigh riding over there. Now, when when the kids were small here, I had a four-wheeler, and there wasn't anywhere out there in this farm country. I'd just pull them behind the four-wheeler. But back in the day, we had some mountains we would go down. Well, I can remember I was probably, what, seven years old in the blizzard of 78, and Me and some of the others had gone out to play in the snow. And I went down this massive hill, this mountain on my sled. And there were drifts everywhere. And the snow was deep, so deep, so many places. I'm only a kid. The rest of them had gone back home and I wanted to go one more time. And I went one more time. And when I got to the bottom of that hill, I was stuck. I got in this snow and it was so deep, 
I, I absolutely too small, too little. I could not take a step. I couldn't move. And then I got scared. I'm going to stand here and freeze to death. I started screaming, help, help. I thought they can't hear me. Help, I'm crying. Help, 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 help. And out of somewhere, or out of nowhere, obviously, my sister Rita heard me. Rita was five years older than me, and she came down. She didn't have the ability to pick me up and carry me. But I had an idea. I said, why don't you just get in front of me and take your feet and clear the snow? And every time you take a step, I'll step behind you. I'm really preaching good right now. And so Rita got in front of me and she stepped and cleared the snow and took a step. Cleared the snow and took a step. Cleared the snow and took a step. And I was able to step in the cleared areas and in the footprints of my sister all the way home. And when David said the steps of a good man are ordered of God, it's impossible for us to walk where God wants us to walk. Yeah. That's why 2,000 years ago Jesus came down and he pushed the snow. I will help you get where you need to get. You still have to take your steps. They are ordered of me, but I'll show you the path by stepping in, stepping in it. And you can step in my steps and step in my prints and make it all the way. God helps those who help themselves. The real truth is we're all stuck as human beings. We can't advance. We can't move forward. We can't be better people. We can't be the man that we, we want to be. We can't be the woman we want to be. Can't be the father. Can't be the husband. Can't be the person we want to be. But Jesus said, I'll get in front of you and I'll order your steps. I will make a way and you can follow me in my footprints and be the man that I want you to be and be the woman I want you to be. Be the boy be the girl, be the person I'll get you where you need to get and I'm preaching good right now Amen. if I have to say so myself Amen. thank the Lord what's he do he lifts us out, he orders our steps, he enables us and empowers us to do and be what we couldn't be before have you ever considered have you ever considered uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter? Here's a guy that has walked with Jesus for three and a half years. Eyewitness saw him open blinded eyes and unstop deaf ears and cause the lame to leap for joy. Peter saw these things. Peter himself went out and preached under Jesus' authority and cast out devils. And healed the sick. They saw all this and did all this. And when they came back and were excited about it, Jesus said, don't even rejoice in that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Here's a man that's been saved. I mean, he is, he's got faith in Christ. But when they took Jesus away to crucify him, Peter followed far off. When Jesus is being tried, he's standing out beside a fire. And someone says, you're one of them. You're with him. <laughs> oh, no, not me. Don't try to put me in that crowd. I mean, yeah, I know, now I've, you know, I've been to Cross Point a couple times, but I'm not one of those radical, crazy Christian people now. Don't, <laughs> don't put me in that crowd. I know that preacher over there is a little wild. He gets a little wild sometimes. I'm, you know, I mean, every now and then I'll go, but don't, don't now. I'm not really one of them. Amen. Isn't, that what, isn't that what Peter was saying? Yes. Not me. No. No, sir. A little bit later, someone says, you're one of them. No, no, not me. And a little lady 
He says, I saw you with him. You're one of them. And Peter, the Bible says, began to curse and shroud who he was in Christ. I'll just make myself look enough like the world that they won't think that I'm one of them. I'll, I still want to be around just in case. You know, a lot of people want to be in the Lord's army. They just want to be in the secret service. I'm going to be stealth. I'm going to fly in. A, I'm, really, I'm going to fly in under the radar. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Is that what happened with Peter? He's like, blankety, blank, 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 blank. No, no. See how I talk? His followers wouldn't talk that way. And he denied the Lord three times. But that same guy, on the day of Pentecost, everyone say 50. 50. 50 days later, with the same crowd and the same Jewish leaders and the same Roman Empire and the same ones that crucified Jesus, are you with me? That same culture, that same group of people, Peter explodes out of the upper room, infused and empowered with the person of the Holy Ghost, and jumps up on a stump, I'm kind of putting it in my own thoughts, and starts raising his voice above the crowd of people that are there for Pentecost. And he starts screaming at this crowd and looks at the, the council and looks at the Roman Empire, and looks at the soldiers and everybody else and said, you crucified him, but God raised him from the dead. And he went back to heaven, and he's praying for us now, and one day the moon is going to turn to blood, and the stars are going to rattle out of their sockets and fall to the earth. And that same man's going to come back, King of kings and Lord of lords. And the crowd said, what do we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And 3,000 people got saved that day and put their faith in Christ. What in the world happened to this man? Here's a man that by the fire said, I'm not one of them. I'm not a follower of Christ. And began to shroud his eyes identity and swear and try to show himself like the world would act so that he could hide who he was and who he had been with. That same man, 50 days later, explodes out and preaches the gospel knowing there's a possibility they'll crucify him just like they did Jesus. What's the difference? He was infused and empowered and enabled by the person and presence of the Holy Holy Ghost because he was filled with God and God in him allowed him and caused him the ability to be what he could not be and do what he could not do. The same man who couldn't did. The same man that wouldn't did. And I remind you, Paul said, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Remember this. Self-help is not enough. You need God. You need His presence. You need His power. You need His word. You need His grace in your... You need... I'm really preaching better than you're letting on. People say to me, I want to and I'm trying and I'm this and I'm that. Allow God to help you. Allow God to be in you and through you what you cannot be yourself. We need the fullness of God. That's why Peter said, we have, later on he said, I have, I have become a partaker of the divine nature. What humanity could not do, now we can. God helps those who help themselves. The real truth is, None of us can genuinely help ourselves. You can't change on your own. I can't change on my own. I can't get out of the pit. I can't make it through the depth of life that I'm stuck in. You ever feel stuck? 
And I can't stand up in front of this world and this culture and say, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus without God's help. Well, I'm going to have to let you go home at some point. There's a lot of preaching there. But David had it right when he said, I'm looking to the hills from whence comes my help. My helps, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Why do we look everywhere except the one that created it all to begin with? You know there's nobody knows you better than he knows you. As a matter of fact, God knows you better than you know you. He created you in your mother's womb. You say, God knows me better than I do? Yep. How many hairs are on your head? Hmm? There's not a person in this room can tell me how many hairs are on their head. Unless, of course, you're a certain select group of people. (laughs) And for big tall Mike back here, he can say there's not a hair between him and the Lord. (laughs) But he does have facial hairs. How many hairs are on your head? You can, we don't know, do we? We don't know. But I can reach up and pull one out, and God will say, there went 1,562. He'll know exactly which one it was. So allow God to help you, the one that knows you better than you know you, and he knows what's best for you. God helps those who help themselves. The real truth is, We can't help ourselves. We need him. Stand with me, please. Before we go home this morning, I wonder if there's anybody that would say, Preacher, today I need God to help me. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to take action. See, here's the half-truth. The half-truth is, God said, if you'll draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. And I'm going to ask you to do something about it. I wonder if there's anybody in this place that would say, Preacher, this morning, without a big, long, emotional pull, without singing any music at all, would say, today I need God's help. And I'm going to step out of my seat, and I'm going to come, and I'm going to stand or kneel right here, and I'm going to ask God to do something in my life, in my home, Whatever it may be, I'm going to ask God today to help me. Anybody like that before we go? Thank you, Lord. Anybody else would say, I'm going to step out. I'm going to come. I need God to help me. Father, I thank you and I praise you for my sister. You know what it is she's facing. You know what it is she needs. She stands here in recognition and in faith that she needs your help. I pray that you will bow the heavens and come down. I ask, Lord, that you would get in front of her and clear the way she can step in your steps. That you'll lift her out of what she needs lifted out of and clear the way for she can go where she needs to go. And God, empower her and enable her this day and in the days to come. May every plan, every purpose and scheme of the adversary be defeated. And your name be glorified in her life. And Lord, I pray your blessing would rest upon each person here today. Each one that's been here, each one, God. And as we leave this place, would you smile upon your children, cause your face to look toward them, give them your grace that's unmerited, your love that's never-ending, and your favor that's true and real. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.